right, friends, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, as we come into this place, open our hearts and our ears to hear from You, to know You better, and to bring to application all that we are learning. Lord, we pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones this week. We pray for those who are continuing to recover from illness this week. We pray, Lord God, for those who are traveling. We pray, Lord God, for those who are seeking You. We pray, Lord God, for all who need a touch from Your hand. Guide and direct us through this evening. And minister to us. Minister through us. And may we be light in Your kingdom and in this dark world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Alright, it's been a minute since we've done the Bible books, so let's do those. Starting with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Again, if you don't have those memorized yet, just keep working on them. They'll come. It just takes time. And you can always use that page at the front of your Bible that's got all the Bible books listed and cheat. That's how you learn. Just look at it, walk through it time again. Again, the whole purpose of doing that is so that as we look at these Bible things, and I say open to, and you're in this book, if you don't have any idea the 66 books in order, which way do you flip? You know, if, if you haven't gotten, you know, that name, yeah, that, that, that Corinthians thing is different than that Chronicles thing. And so if I'm in Luke and I say Corinthians or Chronicles, which way do you go? That's why I want you to know the books of the Bible because it helps you to find things in a quicker way and it gives you that, you know, so, so you can laugh when the pre- preacher stands up and says, you know, open up to second hesitations. And you're like, wait, that's not, that's not one of the books, you know, uh, so that you have a familiarity with that as well. Join with me in Acts chapter 10 tonight. We're going to continue in our study of the fear of the Lord. Uh, My expectation this evening is that we're going to get through most all of the New Testament this evening and potentially start into the next uh, piece uh, pieces. Again, we're looking at the fear of the Lord, but I also wanted to unpack some of the things like when not to fear the Lord and what the fear of not to fear other gods and there's there's other verses that I've grouped as well. I want to look into those. But tonight we're going to start in Acts chapter 10. And we'll work through that. And my expectation is we'll finish up next week. And so that will give us seven portions, seven lessons, which seems like a godly number. So we'll just go with uh, seven uh, iterations of this lesson on the fear of the Lord. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing and gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So again, what we're looking at as we do this biblical study is what does the Bible say about someone who has the fear of the Lord? This time it's spoken backwards. It's God-fearing instead of fear of God. But it's the same idea. So what's being said about being God-fearing? How is He described? 
He's a God-fearer, but what else? He's devout. He gives generously. And he prays regularly. Again, as we've looked through the Old Testament, we've seen how this pious life and proper response to God and His holiness has been the mark of the fear of the Lord. And as I shared with you before, as we shift into the New Testament, things aren't going to change much. But it's interesting to look to see what aspects the New Testament focuses on as well. In that same chapter, verse 22, just 20 chapters below, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Again, Cornelius the God-fearer. This time he's not referred to as devout or generous or regular prayer. He's referred to as being righteous and respected. Fascinating how within our culture, if we are behaving as Christ has called us to behave, even though they hate what we stand for, they still respect us because we're doing what we say we're going to do. And if we have that integrity as Christians, even non-believers will respect as well as believers. And so that's a sign of being a God-fearer or having the fear of of the Lord. Same chapter down to verse 34 and 35. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Peter begins to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears Him and does what is right. Again, fear of the Lord does what is right. So we have this connection. And this connection goes from here in chapter 10 to chapter 13 at verse 16. So Acts chapter 13 and verse 16. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. So for most of the Jewish community, they're God-fearers. That's part of being a Jewish individual was having been raised in this fear of the Lord. But it's interesting here, Paul says, so you men of Israel and anyone who fears God. Anyone who's following what God would have them to do. Pick that up in chapter 13 and verse 26. Just ten verses later. Brethren, son of Abraham's, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. So in these situations, both Peter and Paul, Peter in Acts 10 and Paul in Acts 13, are saying, those of you who are seeking God, those of you who are trying to follow God, are God-fearers. You demonstrate a fear of the Lord. Jump with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And we'll start in verses 20 and 21. Romans chapter 11, 20 and 21. Don't be arrogant. Some Bibles say don't be conceited. But fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. Paul is writing to the Roman church here and he is saying, look, just because you've been given salvation, don't get cocky. The fear of the Lord looks like humility. It's the opposite of conceit. It's the opposite of arrogance. He says, don't be conceited, but fear. Well, whom in the world should we fear then? Well, it's right there in the rest of that sentence. For the Lord. For if God did not spare the natural branches. He's using here the idea of grafting in on plants to teach us as Gentiles how we fit into the kingdom of God through the children of Israel. And he's saying, look, you all know that there are Israelites who are not God-fearers and God has cut them off. He's pruned that bush And you, as Gentiles, as a God-fearer, have been grafted in. 
But you should not be conceited. Don't get arrogant about that fact. But in fact, demonstrate humility. Because if God whacked off the branch that was naturally on that tree, He's sure not going to hesitate to whack you off. So you've got this reminder, and and way too many, I'm afraid, churches and ministers, and I've been guilty of it in, in the past, we sometimes soften what the Bible says. We, we, we try to make it more palatable to our culture. But the reality is, God is here talking through Paul to remind us, guys, this is God's decision. And, and He's going to do what He's going to do. And that should have a respect, a fear, a recognition of God is just and He, he will keep His promises. But He will keep not just His promises to bless, He will also keep His promises to curse. He will not just keep His promises to bring salvation, He will also bring His promises to judgment and to wrath. And we need to be sure that we're with what God is asking us to do. Because if we find ourselves on the other side of that tree, we're going to get our branch whacked off. And we need to recognize that. And that should be a fearful thing. You know, some of the church leaders like Luther were just terrified. What what happens if God cuts me off? And so they were consistently diligent to make sure that their salvation was secure, not because God was flippant, but because I am am oftentimes disobedient and so this whole thing is guys we should fear God because it is he who decides who to prune and who to water and so that should be a a point for us yes absolutely sure right Not in total. Again, the once saved, always saved idea is an oversimplification of a very complex idea. Okay, We are not in a legal contract with God. If it were so, then we could manipulate the contract. We're in a relationship with Him. And... Let me put it this way. Once married, always married. But she gets a vote. I have to maintain that relationship. I can't say we're married and then go live in Mazatlan and never pay any of the bills. And if, if, I, if I walk away from that relationship, where are we? So, so yeah, if we're in this relationship with God, God's saying He's not going to violate His own justice. We're not going to lose our salvation from God's perspective. But can I violate that relationship? Absolutely. So what I want to do in that relationship is not look at it in legalistic terms of, wait, I thought we had a contract, but look at it in relational terms of how do we continue to please and grow together in this relationship? How do I continue to pray and He continues to lead and as He gives guidance, I follow? It's not a, hey, you signed the contract, it's on you. It's not a legalistic idea. It's a relational idea. And so what Paul is reminding us through this book in Romans is to not get arrogant and conceited. And hey, you know, I've said my little prayer and got dunked and now I can go live like a hellion. Because once saved, always saved, right? No, he's saying we're in a relationship with God and we should remember that if we don't respond to that relationship, we void the relationship. So again, it's the once saved, always saved is looking more in a legalistic term and the the idea that's being presented here is more of the 
we need to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We need to be sure that our election is secure. I mean, there's, there's lots of passages in the New Testament that speak to this idea of you don't just show up on the wedding day, say the vows, sign the piece of paper, and walk away, and 20 years later call yourself married. There's a lot more to that relationship than just the initial set of vows. I mean, if I, if I stand in front of this altar and I say, I'm going to do this, and she says, I'm going to do that, and then we never do any of those things, were we ever married? So that's, that's kind of what this idea to kind of help us walk into that. Does that help? Yeah, and again, this, this should not lead to a doubting of one's faith. This should lead to an enhancement of one's faith. The flower industry would go out of business if not for the sins of men. But because we know we screw up, we buy flowers for our wives. Okay? And, and it's that idea of what are we doing to continuously pursue that relationship. It's not a, well, I think I've done enough good things this week. Or I've done too many bad things this It's not that sort of thing that's being talked about here. It's not a comparison thing of you're, you're going to do the right thing or you're going to do the wrong thing. You're in the relationship. And you're a sinner. And you've received the grace and mercy of God. You're already in that relationship. Is that relationship growing? So it's not an, it should not be one of those things of, well, I've done four bad things this week, so I've lost my salvation, so I need to go get rebaptized, and I need to get No, it's one of those of, I screwed up, I need to go get flowers. You know, I, I, I need to get back to this relationship. I need to spend more time in the Word. I need to get closer to Jesus so that I don't screw up as many times next week. So it's a relational call, not a legislative call. Okay? It should not be one to, to make us question our salvation. It should make us desire and pursue that salvation. Where in Revelation? What are, you, what are you referencing? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Here you've got, you know... Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the letters to the seven churches in Revelation, you have Jesus evaluating where they were in their relationship. And I think it's telling. We use one of the verses out of Revelation to talk to the idea of um, salvation. <laughs> You're talking to a group of people that are already in the church. When Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man open the door, I will enter in with him, and the Father and I will sup together. He's talking to the church. The church had shut him out. He's out there going, Hey Christians, you want to let me back in? He wasn't talking to the unsaved. The church uses it that way in our modern vernacular. But if you go back to it, that passage of Behold, I stand at the door and knock is in red letters in Revelation in one of the seven letters to the churches. He's talking to the saved. And he's saying to them, Hey, y'all have shut me out. I would love to come to dinner at your house, Zacchaeus. Get out of the tree. And so it's a, that relational clarion call. Let's continue moving forward. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 22. Colossians 3.22. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. There it is. Colossians 3.22. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Boy, we're going to park here for a minute too. This passage in Colossians is so important to an understanding of faith. 
he is speaking in this section to the rules for Christian households and how we should interact with our society, we can replace the word slaves in Colossians 3.22 with workers. Okay? Because in the Roman Empire, when this was written, every other person was a slave. Okay? One out of two people were slaves in the Roman Empire. So they were working for somebody. And what he's saying to them is, we are to obey to do the things that we do on earth not out of a check-the-block mentality of I'm going to do these good things and my Master will like me. But I'm going to do these things because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to serve because I've been called to be a servant. And, and he's, he's mixing these metaphors. He's trying to help us to see in this letter to Colossians. We are called to do the right thing out of the fear of God. That's an inward thing, not an outward thing. It's interesting, this is the third time in just a few days that I've had this conversation and we've tripped back into it again. One of the Christian traditions groups of churches that are out there are called the holiness tradition. And it's the whole idea of, I live a holy lifestyle. And that's good. We should. That's what this fear of the Lord is. It's walking in the way of the Lord. But what happens in a lot of churches that focus on holiness is we begin to behave a certain way because the behavior is important and fail to recognize that the behavior is the fruit of the inner man. I can fix my behavior. I can pretend. I can blend in. I can chameleon and act like everyone else and not have a relationship with God. I can show up at church on time. I can sing in the choir. I can pay the bills. I can work the... The, 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 the block party. I can do all the right things with the wrong motivation. And I don't know God. All I know is religion. All I know is behaviorism. And what Colossians is really busting out was this idea of if you are a God-fearer, you are going to behave the way God asked you to because of that relationship that you're in, and that's going to show up everywhere. You, you no longer work for a human being, you're working for God. The human being is the one that hires you and fires you and pays your bills, but the reality is, I don't work for this church. I work for Jesus Christ. Now the elders can fire me tomorrow. But the job that I do for the church is not for the church. It's for He who heads the church. The way I do my job at Hearts when I'm putting cabbage up on a shelf, I do to please and honor God. And if I do it to God's standards, my manager's going to love me. That's what he's getting at, is don't get sucked up in the behaviorism. It's not just being obedient. It's being obedient in a sincerity of heart out of the fear of the Lord. So as we look at this verse on fearing the Lord, we've got obedience and sincerity tied to fear of the Lord. Again, we've had obedience in the past in several of the verses in the Old Testament. The corrective, the, the helping portion of this one is we're not simply doing this because it's expected on earth. We're doing this because we, it's an outgrowth of the relationship that I have with God. I want to do... There's another verse in one of Paul's letters. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it as unto the Lord. I want to do whatever it is I'm doing 
to bring glory to God. You know, one of the, my favorite stories is there was a church in Europe, beautiful big cathedral, that had these statues in niches and nooks way up high where nobody was ever going to be. And they decided in the late 70s, early 80s that they were going to reconstruct and re-clean up and just do a lot of repair work. And they started to build scaffolds up and they got all the way up to these statues that nobody had been around in a hundred years. They'd just been way up there. And the workers were just flabbergasted because they got up there and started working on those statues and they were as ornamented and detailed on the back as they were on the front. And the workers were like, you know, most people would recognize that thing's 35 feet in the air. It's in a little nook. People are never going to see the back of this statue. Just make the front and call it a day. And it ministered to those people doing the construction. And it's a reminder to us, the person that made that statue to sit in that nook didn't do it for the people walking on the street. They did it for the glory of God. And they did this excellent and ornamented and complete job as though that thing were going to sit on a table right here in the middle of this stage. Because they were doing it for the Lord. They were doing it in a way that was a sincerity and an overflow of the heart that was obedient to God. And when I meet God's expectations, I'm going to blow everybody else's expectations out of the water. And that's what we're being encouraged to do here is that that fear of the Lord looks like serving the Lord in all things, obeying those who are our masters here on earth, and we all have them. Everybody has somebody they answer to. Be obedient to that person. Right? And the idea of doing it not simply out of, fine, I'll go clean my room. Not that drudgery obedience, but an obedience that says, you know, mom has asked me to clean my room. God would have me to honor that lady. And so I want to clean my room for God in a way that would please Him. Because you know what? God sees everything, so He knows what I chucked up under the bed. So let's not chuck anything up under the bed. Let's actually put it where it goes. Let's actually sweep the floor. Let's actually do the things. Not because I'm trying to impress Mom. But because I recognize I'm working for God. And when I do that, my mom is going to be floored. I wish she were here tonight because we'd have to be doing CPR on her. Because I never cleaned my room when I lived at the house. But she'd be like, oh, where was that boy when he lived in my house? Um, but, but this idea here in Colossians is that the fear of the Lord looks like obedience to those in authority around us with a sincerity of heart. Not merely to please men, but trying to please God. Seeking that relationship. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Hebrews. There it is. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. Again, this one's going to tie right back to that Romans 11 verse we were just looking at. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering His rest, any of you may seem to have come short of it. In other words, there's this, and let's, let's take it apart and take some of these parenthetical thoughts out. Let us fear if any one of us may seem to have fallen short of our relationship with God. But there's a promise that we just took out that we need to stick back in here. The promise remains of entering His rest. The invitation is still there from God. Come back to Me, wayward son. Come back to Me, you who has taken a walk on the wild side. You who have failed. You who have fallen. 
But we should find ourselves in that fear of, am I really doing what God asked me to do? Again, not in the, I'm pursuing salvation because I've got to do all the right things or God won't like me. No, I'm already in relationship with Him. Am I doing everything I can to not violate that relationship? Can I tell the story from a couple nights ago that I was sharing with you this morning? My wife and I, Monday night, went over to Rogers and stayed up till 2 o'clock in the morning going to a rock and roll concert, screaming along with bands that I probably shouldn't have, but we were having way too much fun. I don't know if you've ever been to the amp when they're doing concerts, but the liquor flows. And there was this one young lady sitting a couple of people over from me that had connected with a guy that was sitting next to me. We were out in the grass. And to say she was inebriated would be an understatement. And the poor girl showed up with two of her girlfriends and she just wanted to dance. And she wanted to just dance. And she could and she finds this young kid sitting next to me and she's like, you got to dance with me. When they play this song, you got to dance with me. And so he went, okay, fine. And so... He, but actually, he said, no, I can't dance. And she said, I can teach you. And she did. And it was fun to watch them. And they were having a good time. And everybody was having a good time. And then the bands changed and the kids that were sitting next to me left. She doesn't recognize it because of the level of alcohol in her bloodstream. And so about halfway through the next band, she looks over and goes, are you this kid? She named him and I won't. And I said, No. She says, well, he was supposed to dance with me. I'm like, sweetheart, he did. But you don't remember. But I didn't say it out loud. Long story short, I didn't dance with her. She wanted me to. My wife on the other side of me was completely oblivious this girl was hitting on me. She was having too much fun listening to the band. And I had the choice in that moment. Do I honor this relationship? Because there would have been nothing untoward if I'd gotten up and danced with this girl. It wouldn't have been a big deal. Why didn't I dance with that girl? Because my wife has a foot injury and is in a boot. And we were on a hill. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? I get up and I dance with this girl who isn't my wife on a night when I can't dance with my wife that just doesn't seem right to me. So out of respect for this relationship, and she had no idea, like I said, she was oblivious that any of this was going on. But I had that choice in that moment. How do I best honor that relationship? If I'd gotten up and danced with that girl, I would still be married. Because, you know, we've been to dances before and everybody knows when you're out there on the floor, you're dancing with this person, you're dancing with that person, you're dancing with... You know who you're going home with. But in that moment, I had to make the decision, how do I best honor this relationship? That's what we're being called to here in Hebrews 4 and in Romans 11. How do I best honor? How do I best pursue? How do I best care for the relationship so that I don't fall short of it? Because God's called us to be a nation of priests and a holy people and a peculiar people and to be set apart and to be holy and to be obedient and to have a fear of the Lord. How do I demonstrate that in the choices that I make in pursuing God as though He were a lover? How do I pursue that relationship? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17. 1 Peter 2 and 17. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This one isn't so much about defining the fear of God, but as much as outlining it and giving it some equality. 
I am supposed to respect everyone. That's the expectation on us. I give respect to everyone, especially the people I disagree with. Still give them respect, still give them dignity, still honor who they are as people. We give respect to them. We give love to the family of believers. You're like, I love my church. Yes, that's exactly what the answer should be. I respect everyone, but I love this group. I love the family of believers that are around me. But I fear God. And I honor the emperor or the leader of our nation. Whatever system you happen to live under. So, respect, love, fear, honor. These are used towards different pieces of relationship. But the way we're told to relate with God is fear. And again, don't get away from what we've done for the last six weeks. How is the fear of the Lord defined? What does it look like? So this isn't suddenly that we're supposed to be terrified of God. No, it's the fear of the Lord, which is obedient and it's pious and it's recognizing His glory and it's there's all these different aspects to it. But all of those aspects are how we come to God. Do I respect God? Certainly I respect Him. Do I love God? Certainly I re- love Him. Do I honor God? Certainly I would honor God. But do I fear Him? Do I give Him the full credit and glory that He is due? Because how many of you know you can love somebody you don't respect? Like, I don't know about that preacher. Really? Don't you have a family? I know there's somebody that shows up at your family get-together that you love because they family, but you don't respect them at all because of the way they live and their personality. We're supposed to respect everyone, but we're supposed to love the the fellowship and we're supposed to fear God and honor the national leader. End of Revelation. Revelations 11.18 All the nations were enraged and your wrath came and the time came for the dead to be judged and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Okay, judgment picture. Okay? God's wrath has come, and the time for the dead to be judged has come, and the time to reward. So you've got wrath and judgment against reward. But who gets rewarded? The bondservants, those people who served God, the prophets who spoke for Him, the saints who are all of us, the bondservants, the saints, the prophets, those who fear Your name. You see, again, it's this relational aspect of we have for this season walked with God, been in His way, followed in obedience, honored His holiness, recognized His power, fear of the Lord. And it's all playing in together here. Revelations chapter 14 and verse 7. Revelation 14, 7. He said in a loud voice, Fear God! Give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Again, Fear God, give Him glory. Why in the world would I give Him glory? Well, because He made everything. He made the heavens, He made the earth, He made the sea, He made the springs of water. You worship Him, you give Him glory because you fear Him. Because He's worthy. So worship looks like the fear of the Lord. Piety looks like the fear of the Lord. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 5. Revelation 19 and 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear Him, both great and small. Again, serve God, 
fear God. Those two are put together. Okay, so our service to God is a part of the definition of the fear of God. Okay, so that's one of the New Testament words. We're going to go into the next New Testament word. So that's back to Luke. And we're going to walk through the New Testament again. Luke chapter 5, verse 25. Luke 5, 25. Man is just being healed by God, by Jesus. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Does that sound like anybody was scared? You see, this fear that they were... It was just like... Wow! We have seen some amazing things today. There is a power in our midst. They were struck with astonishment and began to glorify God. They were filled with fear. This fear of the Lord came on them that they were just like, wow, we serve an awesome God. Luke chapter 7, verse 15 through 16. Luke seven fifteen through 16 And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has appeared among us, and God has visited His people. <laughs> it's fun, if you go through the Bible, there was not a single funeral in the entirety of the New Testament that Jesus didn't mess up. Every time there's a dead guy and Jesus, they get raised. He messes up every funeral he goes to. And he shows up at this boy, and this is in Nain, uh, as he shows up at this young man, he, he raises him up. But see how the people respond. A great prophet is here. God is amongst us. And what is that called? Fear. That, that recognition of this is bigger than we are. This is beyond our power. This is beyond our understanding. This is beyond our control. This is awesome. And that's kind of scary. There's some fear involved there when we recognize that this thing is huge. It, you know, it's one thing to stand outside the arena and look down into the yard to see an elephant. It's another thing to stand by their leg. This thing's powerful. And this thing can do whatever it wants to. That's the fear of the Lord. It's a recognition of who He is and what He can do. Luke chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Luke 8, 36 and 37. Those who had seen everything reported to them how the man who had been demon-possessed had been made well. And all the people of the territory of the Gerasenes and the surrounding region asked Him to leave them because they were overwhelmed by great fear. And He got into a boat and returned. Here's Jesus doing miracles among the pagans. And they're like, that's frightening. That messes with our theology. That messes with what we want to believe about our lifestyle. And we just assume you went away. Because that's frightening. I would rather have the truth of God get in a boat and go away so I can continue to live my lie than to actually see the deliverance that this demon-possessed man received. You see how they missed it? The fear of the Lord is a fear that says, wow, He's awesome. I want some of that. These folks saw the awesome power of God and said, would you please go away? I don't want anything to do with that. So This is a different fear they're just terrified. And remember, as we looked in the Old Testament, we saw that continuum of those who are facing wrath 
have a different fear than those of us who are facing reward. As we mature in our Christian faith, as we mature in that relationship with God, how we fear and how that fear grips us changes. We're back into Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Beginning in verse 5. Acts 5, 5. When Ananias, uh uh-oh, Acts 5, you know where we're at. Lion couple that sold a piece of property tried to tell the church that they'd sold it for X amount when they'd actually sold it for Y amount. Ananias heard this. He got busted out. He fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, carried him out, buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yeah, she says, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they're going to carry you out too. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I mean, can you just see it? We all come together in the middle of the church service and I set out a plate out here and I say, okay, bring whatever you want to bring to God. And this one dude brings up his stuff and throws it in the plate. Everybody else is throwing their stuff in the plate. No big deal. This dude comes up, throws his stuff in the plate, and I go, hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? Is, is, that, is that what God told you to put in the plate? Oh yeah, that's what God told me to put in the plate. <laughs> and he's dead. Somebody go call Nelson's. How would this church respond? How would this community respond? A man walked up into the the gathering of God and lied and God knocked him dead for it. No second chance, no grace, no mercy, you're dead. This is a clarion call to each and every one of us that that's exactly what every one of us deserves. We've got this mindset, this arrogance, this conceit that we carry around with us that, oh, God is a merciful God and He's forgiving. I'll get a second chance. Really? These two screwed up and got killed for it instantly. Wait, that doesn't seem fair. You're not God. You have no clue in the world what fear, what fair is. You're only beginning to understand justice. Most of what we call justice is what we want to see happen. We always want justice when we've been offended. We never want justice when we're the offender. This is a clarion call that the church and all who heard about it were seized with a great fear towards God. You know, I wonder how much in our world would change if we were to see the acts of God that we saw in the Old Testament. Everybody's like, I'd like to see a miracle. You realize that a lot of the interactions with God in the Old Testament, He was wiping out 23,000 people for their sin. He was taking out entire nation groups in judgment. We, we want to we put that off as, oh, that's the way God used to operate before the cross. No, that is the same God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the fact that He withholds His wrath does not mean that He is not capable of it at any moment. And you might be the target. He doesn't owe you a thing, and you owe Him everything. Get off your high horse. Because you might not live through your next sin. Well, wait, that's fearful. Absolutely. And it's part of the fear of the Lord. It's part of that recognition that He is the power that we have to deal with. He is the Creator that we have to acknowledge. 
You know, there's a whole lot of folks in this world that I think would change their tune towards their lifestyle of sin if they saw some people knocked down dead in the street. I would be first in that line. I ain't chucking no stones. We have to have this fear of the Lord that recognizes that He's God and we're not in control. He's God and we don't get a vote. He's God. and he, He's God. End of conversation. And unless we come to Him with that level of fear, we disrespect who He really is. As I heard a preacher one time back in the 80's say, we spend, we um, declaw and defanged the lion of the tribe of Judah. Trust me, he's still got all his teeth. And if he decides to shred, he knows how to do it. He is patient with us. But he also knows the end of our days. And we need to recognize that. And if that doesn't bring some level of fear to you, you need to check your fear button because that's a holy fear recognizing that we're answerable to God. He is not answerable to us. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So here we have the fear of the Lord and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit working hand in hand. And the people who are involved in the proper lifestyle of obedience and piety and righteousness and fearing the Lord and are being encouraged by the Holy Spirit and guided and empowered to do that thing are living in peace and being strengthened. I want to remind you this is still the Roman Empire under Nero. And half of them were still slaves. Don't let this be all lollipops and unicorns. Oh, they had a lovely time of peace in the middle of the Roman Empire under Nero. But they were living the life of righteousness, being encouraged by the Holy Spirit. They were peace. They were being strengthened. And oh, by the way, that was contagious. The church kept growing. It kept increasing in number. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 17. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 17. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, we're doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. So here we see the fear of the Lord beginning to look like the knowledge of what Jesus does, the knowledge of what evil looks like, and holding Christ in high honor. I recognize that Jesus is God. And I hold Him up and honor Him. Fear Him. Romans chapter 13 and verse 17 Romans 13 and 17. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So what's being said about taxes, customs, fear, and honor? It's due. You already owe it. It's 
So this isn't one of those, well, I'm going to make a choice today to honor God. You already should be honoring God. You should already be fearing God. You are already in the hole. You're already in debt. It's His due. It's what we owe Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians 5 and 11. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. I know what it is to fear the Lord. My next door neighbor doesn't. Boy, do I want to persuade him to understand what the fear of the Lord really looks like because he is hell bound and in trouble. You see, when I fully understand the fear of the Lord, when I begin to apply that fear to my own life, I cannot help but to recognize that there are so many around me that are unsaved, unknowing, clueless, and they need all the help they can get. I'm not that help. God is. My job is to tell them about Him. And I want to persuade them that He is able because I know the fear of the Lord. I know what God is capable of. Of. I can. I know how good my God is. It's not hard to imagine how wrathful He can be in His punishment. And there is not a person on the planet Earth that I dislike bad enough to want God to take care of. To me, I know a lot of people get offended when someone says "God damn" because they say that's blasphemy and you shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain. That's not what offends me. What offends me is, how dare you invoke the wrath of the Almighty God on another human being? Do you have any idea the power in those words? Because if we have a good fear of the Lord, we recognize what His wrath is is and what it looks like we take those things about hades and hell and gehenna from this book and we recognize them to be true and i cannot imagine what an internal torture looks like i cannot imagine what an eternal separation from god looks like i have only ever known the presence of god even when i was sinning against him His Holy Spirit was calling me to Him. I've never known what it was to have God not there. But that's what we're told the judgment of God is. Eternal separation from God. Why in the world would you ever invoke that against another human being? We have a fear of the Lord... We should be persuading people into that same fear. Let me teach you about this holy, omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-over God who has the right and is due. Let me teach you about the fear of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 1, just a page back. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. So if we fear the Lord, we're going to seek to be cleansed. We're going to seek to see our holiness perfected or completed. We want to to encourage this relationship. We want to draw closer in this relationship. 14 verses later in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians 7.15 And His affection for you is all the greater when He remembers that you were all obedient, receiving Him with fear and trembling. Again, that whole thing of, I need God. We come to God out of that fear of God of saying, I know how bad messed up I am. I need help. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, 
speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So as we fear Christ, we are filled with the Spirit, we give thanks, and we subject ourselves to one another. (laughs) It's not hard to subject ourselves to one another when we all realize we're as messed up as the next guy. You see, the world standard says, I'm better than you because I don't do what you do or because I do something you don't. God's standard of the world is you're all sinners. You're all equal. What are you competing for? Oh, but I'm a better sinner than he is. Which way is that? Does that mean you're better at sin or you're worse at sin? Sinner. Philippians chapter 2. There we go. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Continue to work out your salvation, but it's God who's working in you. That seems to be saying we can unplug. So, I am supposed to stay plugged in. I am supposed to continue to work out this salvation with the fear of the Lord and with a trembling and a recognition of His holiness and how far I am fallen from it. I keep in that relationship not pursuing it out of fear, but pursuing it out of relationship with the acknowledgement that if this relationship fails, I'm messed up. Now the reality is, this relationship isn't going to fail because it's God who works in you. But God's not going to work in you unless you let Him. You've got to stay plugged in. You've got to continue to work. You've got to continue to say, you know what? I'm not good enough yet. I can stand here tonight and list all of the things that I've done wrong today. We're not even going to talk about this week. The attitude that I've had, the people that I've said things to in my own mind, the people that I have denigrated in my own estimations, the things nothing got said about, nothing got done about, but just the sins in my own mind remind me on a daily basis, I'm not all that. I haven't arrived. I am far from holy as God would have me to be holy. I'm still broke. I'm less broke than I was when He started working on me, but I am still broken. And I still need a lot of work. I've got to continue to work through that salvation with that fear and that trembling because it's God who's working in you to work and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. That means sometimes He's going to take me down roads I don't want to go and sometimes He's going to want to fix things that I don't think are broke. And I have to continue to let Him. I have to continue to stay with Him. I have to continue to stay in it. I have to continue to work that out in concert with God who's working it in me. Suddenly I'm reminded of the verse that talks about being yoked with Christ. Two animals that are yoked together are working together. I'm supposed to work. God's doing His work. And that's how salvation comes to be. It's a relationship. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 20. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 20. Those who continue to sin, rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. So, we're supposed to fear sin. We don't. We find it entertaining. You can see that in elementary school. Two kids start bashing each other's skins in, and every kid on the playground goes, fight! and runs over to watch. It's our nature. We come to it. And the Bible is teaching us here that we are supposed to rebuke sin. We are supposed to 
call out sin so that others will go, hey, wait, that's not okay. God's not okay with that. It's not an acceptable lifestyle. It's not something that I should be doing. Wait, I should be... Wait, God judges that? Yeah. He does. And here's the fear of the Lord. That He will judge sin. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. You are going to face God at the judgment. You better respect that. You, you better have that everyday fear. Not terror, not knees knocking, but that recognition. I will be answerable to God for every act, every word, every thought, every deed. How then should I live? We need to recognize and live our, our time as foreigners. I love that idea. You ever stayed at somebody else's house that you were afraid to mess up? You're living like a foreigner in somebody else's land. And God is saying to us, we should live our life on earth as though we were a visitor in God's house. Because that's really what we are. This is God's planet. He can do whatever He wants to with it. And we just happen to be taking up residence for a short time. And we are like grass. Here today, gone tomorrow. Blown out by the wind, burned in the fire. We've got to get past the idea that these 70 or 80 years are all important. The only thing that's all important about them is God and His relationship with us in that time. It's about Him. And we should live as foreigners here in reverent fear. Revelations chapter 11 and verse 11. Revelation 11, 11. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. This verse is in the midst of the actions of Revelation, and the two prophets that have been sent by God have been slaughtered by the Antichrist, and their bodies are left in the street, and after some time, they get back up again and freak the world out. Because everybody at this point will think the Antichrist is all-powerful and suddenly something he destroyed gets up and goes, neener, neener. You're not all that. And it will bring a terror to those who see it. A fear of the Lord. I'm going to go just a minute or two over tonight. But I want to finish out by talking about the Greek words that we have been using tonight. And then we'll come back next week and finish up this session. Phobeomai and phobeo are the two Greek verbs that we've been using tonight. And phobos is the Greek noun that comes from that same root family. That might sound familiar. Phobos. Phobia. You see the Latin... Phobos in the Greek becomes phobia in the Latin becomes fear. You know, he's got a phobia. He's afraid of something. That's where we get the word. It is to be affrighted and to flee. It is to terrify, frighten, to fear, dread, fear reverentially, to reverence, to be afraid to do a thing, to be reluctant, to scruple, to be apprehensive, to be fearfully anxious, to be alarmed, to be fearfully impressed. So wait, that's a whole lot of different definitions. Yeah, it's a continuum. You have the fear of knees knocking and the fear of worship and all the different fears in between. All wrapped up in this set of words. Expressing, expressions containing the words of the Phobos group always describe a reaction to man's encounter with force. The scale of the reaction ranges from spontaneous terror and anxiety to honor and respect. 
which already presupposes mastery of the experience through reflection. Those are some big words. Let's see if we can make that make sense. The first time this encounters with me, I get terrified of it. The next time I'm a little less fearful and a little more respectful. And as I continue in that reflection and experience, I grow in a reverential awe of that thing that scared me instead of wetting down my leg. Okay? As we become more mature in our exercise and experience, that fear... Now, there's times that we might be up here in this continuum and we slide back. Guys, I used to walk plate lines doing construction. I didn't used to have a fear of heights. But it's been a long time since I've stood on a 2 by 4 8 foot in the air. If I were to get up on one today, I would be very, very nervous. And There was a time in my younger life I was running around those like a spider. Why? Because I had that respect. But I've lost that experience. And so now if I get up on that height, I get more frightened. Okay? I'm not generally afraid of heights. I can stand up here on the edge of the... But I'll be honest with you, open staircases terrify me. I don't know why. I know that they're structurally sound, but as I'm walking up them, the higher I get, the tighter everything in my insides gets. Why? That thing's not going to fall. I know it's structurally sound, but there's something about that experience. Now, once I've been up there for a while, yeah, I'm okay again. Again, we move along that spectrum of fear. I'll never forget being at St. Paul's Cathedral in London with my family. And we were all the way up and Daniel and I decided to go outside the dome. You can do that. You can look out over the city of London and it's beautiful. And I'm standing up there and literally this thing is about as wide as this monitor. I mean, it is a very small platform that goes around that and you're like 200 feet off the ground. There is a little bitty retaining wall that's probably about that high. Just about knee level. So you could hit that sucker and go right over it. I'm fine up there. I'm standing up there, got my back to the dome. I'm looking out over London. Everything is cool until that what, 12, 13 year old boy stepped up to that edge to take a picture. And the moment I saw my young son move toward the edge of that, every fear in my life set upon me. We have this continuum of fear and phobia and phobos and this Greek idea and, and thus everything that we're talking about falls somewhere in a continuum. So it's, it's very difficult for us to say, well, fear looks like this. Well, yeah, it does in this situation, but it looks like this over here and it looks like that over here and it looks like this over here and it depends on your experience with that thing. Again, ranging from spontaneous terror and anxiety to honor and respect. As we come back next week, we're going to look at some other passages and some other words. And then I'm going to close this all up. But tonight, I just want us to focus back to this idea of all of the various levels, all of the various different experiences of the fear of the Lord from terror to respect, from honor and glory to judgment and wrath, to obedience and piety and worship and walking in the way and living in the way God has called us to. All that we've looked at in these six weeks together all ties into this idea of fear of the Lord. As I close tonight, I just want us to stop and think about Are we fearful enough? How big is your God? Have you gotten so comfortable with God that you no longer have a fear of Him? If, if I've learned anything from this study thus far, it's that most of the time I treat God like a pussycat instead of a lion. Well, I honor Him, I respect Him, I love Him. But do I fear Him? Do I keep in mind 
how much higher His ways are than mine. His thoughts are than mine. His holiness is than mine. His ability is than mine. He is not just a big us. We are not just a little Him. He is God. And the fear of the Lord is due Him. Do we fear Him? Heavenly Father, I thank You for this teaching. And it's been a little longer tonight than it has in other weeks as we tried to finish out this portion of the New Testament. But Lord, I pray that in these moments we might be challenged. We might be uncomfortable. We might have to go back and rethink ourselves. Because maybe we haven't feared You the way You have taught us that we're supposed to. Maybe we've put up some theological hedges around ourselves to make ourselves comfortable that don't really exist in the spiritual realm. Perhaps we've become complacent. And we've treated You like a concierge rather than the Almighty Sovereign King. Speak to us this night, I pray. As individuals and as a group of what it is to fear the Lord. And we'll thank You for it. Amen.